in the sermon? And that, oh, yeah, so thank you. Matthew 7, Jesus said, ask. Everybody say ask. I love ask, A-S-K. Ask, A, seek, S, knock, K. Isn't that unique? A, ask, S, seek, K, knock. And that's what Jesus said do. So he says, ask and it shall be given to you, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, it's going to be open. Now I'm going to read a little bit further for you. He said, or what? Man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, going to give him a stone. Or he asks for a fish, he's going to give him a serpent. If you then, being evil, know how to give good f- gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even unto them. In other words, be kind because it's going to reciprocate. For this is the law of the prophets. Father, I thank you for your word. Need your anointing this morning. I thank you, God, for the people that are here. There's a hunger in this house. There's a hunger in our community, in our state, to see a move of God. To see change in our schools, Lord, in our businesses, in our homes. In Jesus' name, everybody shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Jesus was telling them not to be afraid to approach him. Don't be afraid to approach him and ask him for your kids, for the things that are going on in your life, for your health. Amen. Ask him. So the best way to learn is to ask. If you don't know something, ask about it. Amen. You have not because you. I said you have not because you. There are reasons for not getting close to God or asking God something. Guilt. Sometimes we feel guilty, so we don't go to God and ask him things. Uh, condemnation, we condemn ourselves and beat ourselves up. Fear, we have a God fear, amen, that, that somehow God is going to punish us or something, so we don't go near him. Uh, shame, shame, we know that God knows what we've done, so we don't go and ask him anything. Amen. Inferiority, we beat ourselves up and say, why would God do anything for me? Why would he help me out or do anything? Amen. So those are some things. So the events I want to talk to you about today go way back thousands of years. Open your Bible. to You should already be at 2 Kings. Amen. But it goes way back, and there are several characters. We got a guy named Naaman. Naaman is a tremendous warrior. He's a commander. We got a little servant girl that was kidnapped. Amen. And brought into a land, a foreign land. We've got a, a, a leprosy. Matter of fact, Naaman has leprosy on him. We have a prophet by the name of Elisha. Elisha is a man of tremendous discerning. And Elisha has a servant that serves him. His name is Gehazi. Amen. So as I walk through the events, I want to just lay this out. Here's what I found through life. And this is not to be mean. We don't understand our Bibles. We don't understand history. This is about history. This is learning something about what's going on. So this is about 600 years before Jesus. And these are the days when the promised land was divided into two kingdoms. So you got Israel is to the north and Judah's to the south. There's a separation. We understand here even in America about separations, don't we? Yankees. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was a time of political and moral decline. And because of this, the people of God were oppressed by their enemies, particularly Syria. Joram was the king in Israel to the north at this time. He was the son of the wicked king Ahab. Who did Ahab run around with? Jezebel, right? And and we have issues with Jezebel. Elijah did. Now we got Elisha showing up. Elijah's already in heaven. He went up in a a, a tornado. Mm -hmm. And Elisha had succeeded Elijah. As God's prophet. Now, at the head of this impressive column of military might on a snow white stallion, let me describe this man the general, who has once again led the army to victory. The scripture describes him. His name is Naaman. He's a general of the armies of the king of Syria. He is a favorite, a close friend with his nation's ruler, King Benahad. Amen. In fact, Naaman was a very popular man. Everyone liked him. You would too. He reminds me of Schwarzkopf. Y'all remember him? Amen. He reminds me of Patton. 
Amen. A man that's just of, of, of action. Let's get something done. Everybody, like you, you would like shining in the sun of the medals of Naaman, had won on the field of battle throughout all of his career, a man of courage. You can picture him as he rides astride that magnificent white steed in the uniform of a general. And I want you to notice, thrown carelessly, amen, across his chest and draped over his arms is a bright colored sash. Just a bit of decoration bright in his uniform. But you know, wait a minute, if you look at it really good, the sash is not careless. As a matter of fact, it's tucked in very carefully, wrapped around one of his arms and one of his hands. It was almost as if he was trying to hide the arm and hand. The truth was, he was concealing a terrible fact from the public and maybe even from himself. The scripture says that Naaman was great, he was mighty, but he had leprosy. Amen. 2 Kings 5 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram through him. Catch this thing. The Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, from the north. Amen. She served Naaman's wife. She had, she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Don't you love it when somebody loves a, a preacher or a prophet or an evangelist so much that they would say, if only so-and-so would see that man, I believe. I, I get the phone calls all the time. People say, you know, so-and-so told me to call you because you could help my brother. You could help my sister. And I say, man, I can barely help myself. But I'm going to do the best I can for you, all right? And I see God change their lives over and over again. And this is what I see. Naaman went to his master. Amen. He told him. So we got these degrees. We got a leader commander. We got somebody over the commander. We got a, a wife. We got a servant here. And the servant said, if only he knew about Elisha, I promise you, something would change in his life. So Naaman heard about it. He went to his master, told him what the girl from Israel had said. What he did, it was hope. Everybody say hope. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him the talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold. My goodness, he had to have a train of, of, of animals to carry all of this uh, giftings. Amen. Ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I'm sending you, my servant Naaman, to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Now that letter went to the king. The king. The king's like any politician. He can't fix nothing. He can't, he can't get nothing done. So somehow, and I don't know how, but as I'm reading this, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robe and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of this leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a fight with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robe, and that, that's the thing. How did Elisha know that the king tore his robe? Was Elisha in the court? Did he get a text from somebody at the, at the, at the, at the court? I don't know. How did he see it in the spirit? Amen. How did he, I don't know. Hmm. Things I ponder. Then Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his robe. He sent this message. Why have you torn your robes? You were good clothes. Have the man come to me and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel. In other words, he said, I got this. I got this. Send that bad man to me. Send that Naaman to me. Send that leopard man to me. I got this. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots. And he stopped. Listen, a chariot. Nobody drove Mercedes then. But here he shows up. Amen. With well, chariot. Stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Yo. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be stored and you will be cleaned. Leprosy. Look at the preacher right now. Let me talk to you. Leprosy starts with a spot. 
Leprosy deals with sensitivity. It's dealing with the nerves. The muscles lose strength. The limbs, amen, inner ear, sight, mind, sensibility, voice. Here's what happens spiritually. I've seen people get leprosy in the church. It just started with a spot. But they lose sensitivity. They lose the fact that somebody around them is hurting. They think everything is about them. They, they forget that what they're going through is to help somebody else around them. And God's trying to use that believer to help that believer catch hold of something here. But they got leprosy. They can't hear. Their hearing is affected. They, can't, they have no vision. Leprosy. Naaman was tired of not feeling anymore. Le leprosy is simply that. As a matter of fact, it's, it's actually, if, if I looked at it correctly, it's known as Hansen's disease. It's just a loss of sensitivity. And if you lose sensitivity, then all of a sudden you start getting hurt. And then your fingers start losing the ends off of it. Amen. Your, your eyes, you don't even close your eyelids anymore. Amen. And all of a sudden things get in your eyes and you start losing sight. And that leprosy just starts eating away. And then, then all of a sudden infection sets in and, and you die. So he's in trouble. And this leprosy has, a, has affected him, amen, and began to hurt him. Now, let's keep, walk, let's keep walking through this. Verse 11, but Naaman went away. He got mad. He said, Elisha sent a servant and said, go tell that man to go, go to the river Jordan and duck himself seven times. Naaman got angry. He got upset. He said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Isn't it funny how we think we know how God's going to heal us? Amen. How we think we know how God's going to answer our prayer? Amen. How we tell God, this is what I want you to do. Amen. This is how I want you to handle it. So he said, so Naaman, Naaman got pride in it. He said, you know what? I want God. I am a professional. I am a professional commander. I, I have won wars, and you want me to go duck in muddy water? I want to go to clean water. I want to go to these two rivers. I want to go somewhere, amen, isn't far, far, and, and a banner of the rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? I, don't put me in the muddy water. I don't want to go in the muddy water. Don't baptize me in the muddy water, in a horse trough, in a swimming pool. I want that nice, clean, flowing water. Amen. Couldn't I wash in them be clean? So he turned and he went off in a rage. He's mad. It's amazing to me how we will lose our healing. We will lose our, 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 our uh, mental attitude because we want things our way. We stomp our foot. We get mad. In Louisiana, they call it the fungia. We'll take it a little bit like they were there. And they say, hey, 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 I ain't coming over there. They get mad, get all upset, and, uh, and pout. They pout. I, I preached and watched adults pout. <laughs> so Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, <laughs> if he told you to do something great, wouldn't you, wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be clean? So he goes, Amen. See, here's the thing that hits me. This, this disease was the most feared disease of all. Amen. So now we understand that he's got it. So he goes in verse 14. So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Everybody say seven. seven. He goes down three times. Nothing happening. Five times. Nothing happening. Oh, can you imagine the feeling of that seventh time as he's going down? And he's thinking to himself, what's this going? I'm doing everything that he, that, that I, I pray to God that that prophet ain't embarrassing me in front of all my men, making me humble myself. God help me, Jesus. And he goes down and he comes back up and he opens his eyes and his skin is clear. And the same healing that Jesus did in the New Testament, 
he was doing in the Old Testament. And this man comes up clean. Amen. Something beautiful. The flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. In other words, no age spots, no wrinkles. Amen. No hair on his arm. He come up looking good. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on, see, that excitement got all over him, amen, and he stood, amen, there in front of the attendant. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And then he looked at Elisha, he said, please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet Elisha answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. He said, how, he brought 6,000 shekels of silver. He brought thousands of, of, of sets of uh, nice long coats, amen, for him to wear. Amen. He brought him some fine Luke Casey boots. Amen. He had him set up. He said, please take a gift. Bro, I'm healed. I'm well. Prophet of God, please do this for me. And I said, I can't do it. As soon as the Lord lives, I ain't going to do it. What a moment. What a moment. And I love this seven. Everybody say seven. Seven, somebody said, Joshua chapter 6 tells us the priest was carrying the ark around, around the, the, uh, Jericho seven times. And on the, se on, the se on the last day, they went around the thing, they went around seven days, six times. Woo, woo, woo. But the last day, seven laps, and they shouted, and the walls came down. Seven is all through Scripture, all through there. In, in Psalm 119, and I love this, 164. It's, it's the longest psalm. If you want to memorize a psalm, memorize Psalm 119. I'll, I'll give you $100 if you can memorize Psalm 119. $100 bill if you memorize Psalm 119. And I don't care what translation you use. Seven times a day. Seven times a day. I praise you for your righteous laws. The Word of God. Then he says, David, David says, Great peace of they who love your law. The book. And nothing can make them stumble. One translation says, nothing shall offend them. Boy, you're talking about a verse you need to write down. Bo uh, you need to write both verses. I'm going to tell you why. Because if I give God praise seven times a day, if, I, if in the morning I get up, I love you, Jesus. After my coffee, I love you, Jesus. 10 o'clock, I love you, Jesus. When I have my Dr. Pepper at 12, I love you, Jesus. 12 o'clock at 2 o'clock, when I have a snack, I love you, Jesus. Amen. At supper, I love you, Jesus. If, and listen, I know you're saying, I ain't saying seven. I ain't, I ain't trying to make you do seven. What I'm saying here is, if we give God praise throughout the day, we are not going to have room to be offended with anybody. Hear it again. Great love and though they love that those who love your law and nothing shall offend them. But don't forget the verse before it. If I give God some praise all day long, I ain't got room to stay offended with people. Amen. I ain't gonna let them bother. So it's very important. Proverbs 4, 24, 16. For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again, but the wicked are brought down by calamity. That's why I look at people and say, somebody said, Well, you done fell off the wagon, Pastor. I should give him a moment. I know that sister. I know that brother. Amen. They're struggling right now, but they're going to get right back up. Amen. They're going to get back on the wagon. They're going to be all right. Amen. Keep Matthew 18, 21. G Jesus said, if you forgive, <laughs> this, is, this is a funny story. Peter came to Jesus and said, uh, excuse me, was it Peter? Yeah, Peter came to Jesus and said, how many times I got to forgive John? <laughs> Are you here? Twelve guys running around for three years. Getting on each other's nerves. Are you hearing me? I mean, it's aggravating. So Peter asked Jesus, how many times I had to forgive John? What's funny about that, and, and I may have to preach this again, but, but there's a time when Peter and John go together in the book of Acts. They together. So it's just funny how God puts them back together. But Peter, how many times I got to forgive? And Jesus said, uh, he, and, and Peter puts it out there. He said, how about seven times? How about seven times? You know why he said seven? Because he was at six. When I hit seven, I'm going to hit that brother right there. I'm going to punch him. I'm telling you. Amen. I'm fed up with him, Jesus. And Jesus said 70 times seven. Woo! 490 times a day. Y'all didn't know I could do that, did you? <laughs> I do a little math. 490 times a day. Just keep forgiving. Don't let anybody own you. Don't let somebody live rent-free in your head. Amen. Release them and let them go. I got, I got to keep going here. Elated by his healing. Clean. Healed. I know all y'all know about my 
issues with warts. I had warts on my fingers when I got saved. And I struggled lifting my hands because I was, uh, I was nervous about people seeing it. I mean, I got uh, insecure and I asked God to take my warts away. I'd been, I'd burned them off and froze them off and chewed them off and and I remember one morning after I got up and asked God to do that I looked at my hands and they all the warts were gone Amen. I realized how much I have so little to y'all but it was so big to me Amen. that the insecurity you try to hold hands with your girlfriend and all you see is your warts <laughs> try to pick your nose and your finger gets stuck in there Y'all don't know the trouble I've seen. <laughs> this prophet hide his hand. I'm sorry. Naaman, the commander, would hide his hand. He was, he didn't want nobody to see it. When fighting, he didn't care. He'd just cut your head off. But around all of his other men, he struggled. Now he's clean. So, mate, come on, come on, I should take it. And I want you to hear this. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, begged him, please, he refused. So what did he take? Verse 17. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant. Notice now his humility. What did he call himself? Your servant. When he showed up, he's commander hey in, a, in a chariot. Got angry, rage, upset. Now healed, I'm your servant. I'll serve you, Elisha. Amen. Humility's come over. Be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. What was the one thing? The one thing is this. When I work for fools and they worship other gods, know that my heart is toward God. In other words, he said, when, my, when the king comes and he grabs my arm and he kneels down to worship, forgive me that I'm there. And I, I've used this scripture before because I've had friends that have worked in places that were of, of kind of ill repute, places that others would say. I had a great fr I've had several friends that worked for uh, uh, beer companies, and they come to me and say, Pastor, what do I do? I said, don't drink it. <laughs> Just make it because somebody's going to make it. Amen. Make money off the heathens as long as you can. He was living between a rock and a hard place. You follow me? That's where this guy was. So Elisha said, go in peace. And after that, Naaman had traveled some distance. Now the story's not over and I got to fly. Gehazi, Elisha's got a servant. His name's Gehazi. All these guys have servants. They had people Lord work with. So Gehazi, he was foolish. He was a servant with greed in his heart. He overheard the refusal of Elisha. He seized the moment for financial gain. Verse 20, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master's too easy on Naaman, this Armenian, by not accepting from him what he brought as surely as the Lord lives. I'm going to run after him and get something from him. I'm going to make this man give me something. He's going to give me some money. Amen. I'm going to make some money. Listen to me. Proverbs 15, 27. He that is greedy of gain troubles his own house. You greedy of gain? You, and I, listen, I don't care if you spin the wheel. I don't care if you work the slots. I don't care if you spend time in Vegas. But I'm going to tell you this. Vegas wasn't built because you were winning. I was on a cruise boat. Watch people go in there and ching, cha ching, cha ching. Amen. They come out and say, how did you do? I won 100. But they never tell you how much they lost over and over and over again. Be careful of this stuff, guys. I mean, again, I'm not against you doing it. I ain't going to say don't do it. I know some of you just get into all that. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you straight up, if you ain't tithing, you better quit. If you ain't giving to the house of God, you better quit. If you're giving to the heathens, God help you. That's it. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, it. some folk just don't give a dime. <laughs> You hear what I said? I said some folk don't give a dime. They won't give a tithe, but they'll sure give it to the heathen. Yeah, he's a servant. He ran after him. Not accepting from him what he brought, as surely as the Lord lives, I'm going to run after him. 
Proverbs 28, 25, a greedy man stirs up dissension, but he who trusts the Lord will prosper. I'm just going to trust God. Amen. Listen, so in this, you got a servant girl who wanted what's best for her master, mm. Naaman, and a servant, Gehazi, who wanted what's best for himself. See what I'm saying? When we serve, serve selflessly. Amen. I want to serve selflessly. It's not about me. It's about somebody else. Now I got to close, Jojo. Amen. Now he became, verse 22, everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, so he's called up with, with Naaman. Naaman's out there riding. He got the He got to turn the music up. Mm-hmm. Amen. He's jamming. Y'all, you looking at his hand. I'll tell you what, you do. When you get clean, everything good. Uh, all everything, uh, you know, all the acne gone and stuff. And you just looking at yourself in the mirror, taking a selfie. Say, Amen. This is looking good. He's having feeling good. It, it did, and the Gehazi shows up and said, My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Two guys, two preachers showed up. And, and so please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothes by all means take two talents said Naaman he urged Gehazi to accept it and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags so a talent was a lot of a lot of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing he gave them to his two of two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi when Gehazi came to the hill he took the things from the servants he put them away hit them in the house hit them in the house hit them in the house he sent the men away and they left and he went and he stood before his master Elisha and all of a sudden Elisha asked him where you been where you been Gehazi have you ever had that guilty look <laughs> you ever heard the eagles sing about them lying eyes <laughs> come on somebody give me come on Jesus yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. So we got this moment here where Elisha looked to him and said, uh, where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go. I, I, I ain't going anywhere. I ain't been nowhere. Gehazi answered. Elisha, through God, had just healed the greatest military commander of his time. And you going to lie right. to both of them? To Naaman and Elisha? See, the first lie my master sent me to say, Elisha did not. Second lie, two young men came and need assistance. They did not. Third lie, give them a talent. That's 75 pounds of silver. Mm, two soups. Fourth lie, verse 25, your servant didn't go anywhere. Y'all understand poetic justice? Mm -hmm. Naaman, verse 26, but Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or men servants and maid servants? Hold it right there. Go back. Go back because I want you to catch this. Elisha knew it wasn't just money. He had enough money he could have took from him to have owned olive groves and vineyards and flocks. And he, I mean, he at that moment could have been the wealthiest prophet in the world. But the word was, is this the time? You know what Elisha was doing? He was banking on a favor later. I'm banking on a favor later. We may get raided, and I'm going to need Naaman to come and defend us. I may need this man. Listen, everything, you don't always have to take what, when somebody blesses you when, you. when you're able to bless somebody, you don't always have to take something from them at that moment. You don't always have to you know, uh, tit for tat. No, you leave it alone. Amen. You might need a favor later. My kids have lived off my favors. <laughs> Katie got her head down right now. They've lived off my favors because people felt like they owed me because of the kindness of God in my life toward their life. And I didn't take nothing from them. And so when my kids needed something, and I thank God for that. And I think you would too, and you've done the same thing. Amen. Amen. And you've appreciated it. So the issue was timing. It was timing. Gehazi, you messed up the timing here. Amen. So then he looks at him, and then he said to him, now, now, the, now the next, and this is the tough one here, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants 
Oh, my God, what a price you just paid for 75 pounds of silver. Two sets of clothes. The lies you told will affect your children and your children's children. It will be an inherited disease on you. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence. He was leprous, white as snow. Talk about poetic justice. Talk about judgment. Is this the time? Now I'm going to bring you back to something. Naaman worshiped. He took dirt and he worshiped. Worship keeps us thankful for the provision of God. When he wor- you know why he worshiped? To remind himself of my miracle. To remind himself of the goodness of God. Ask and it shall be given you. Thanksgiving prompts the spirit of humility. Naaman called himself a servant. Amen. He, he desired dirt to worship. Humility is the position of strength. Whenever I humble myself, this, is, this right here is strength. It ain't this. It ain't bowing up. It's humbling yourself. Amen. Gratitude is medicine that heals. Appreciation is exercise that strengthens. And greed and ingratitude affect God. He always has. Amen. Eyes closed just for a moment. This message just spoke to you. It's called loose change and leprosy. There are things in life you do not take. Don't lie. No lies. Release it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. His presence was so strong. It's still strong. Made it easy to preach today. Your receptivity made it easy to share the Word of God today. I believe in my heart there are people here that say, Pastor, I've been away from God, and I sense something just like Naaman. I've wanted to say, I want it this way and that way. And God said, no, I want you to duck in that muddy water. I want you to do something a little bit different. I'm going to take care of things. Not the way you thought. It's going to be different. If this message spoke to you today, lift your hand. Would you do that? Just lift your hand. You know, okay, all right. Hit the right nerve. Hallelujah. Just hold those hands back up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive the word today. We thank you that it changes our lives. It affects us. It comes inside of us and will never be the same again. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for healing in this house. There are people in here that have far more needs than warts. God, they got things that affect their lives. It, 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 it deals with their inferiority. It, it drives them literally into a place of insanity. So, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, take it away. Take it away. God, I thank you for ducks in the pond. I thank you for mercies. I thank you for the number seven. God, I, if we got to go into a dark place or in our bedroom and get down and pray seven times, and we got to try something seven, whatever it takes, God, let us have crazy faith believing you for something. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Pastor David, I've been in churches where 